When I entered the dating world, my father gave me some valuable advice. He stressed that outstanding personalities do not tolerate disrespect, manipulation and dishonesty on the part of women. He encouraged me to stay true to my true self and always strive to be a decent person. I'm sorry to break the disappointing news, my dear. Unfortunately, the merger meeting has been postponed to an earlier date, which means that I will have to leave tomorrow morning and return late on Sunday evening. I understand how important this wedding is to you, especially considering your role as a bridesmaid. But it is important to understand that I have recently been promoted to CFO, and skipping this meeting will have significant consequences for both the company and our future. Unfortunately, you will have to attend the wedding without me. I apologize for such a sudden change. Are you serious? We have been preparing for this event for so long. And as I understand it, I will have to refuse to attend the event alone. Did you think that it would be awkward for me? Is there a way to find a replacement? Sarah, the value of this deal exceeds $2 billion, and I am the main person responsible for this project. You know about the huge efforts that we have put into it over the past year, and unfortunately there is no one who can fulfill my role. A lot of people are counting on our success, and I understand that the situation is not easy. I apologize and want to assure you that I will compensate you for the bonus as soon as the transaction takes place. I understand all your anger, but unfortunately, there's nothing more I can do at the moment. I'll be back on Sunday. It was obvious that she was very upset. She refused to communicate with me and insisted that I sleep in the guest room. The lack of intimacy and physical connection before my trip was unusual. Her cold demeanor and anger were also unlike her usual behavior. I tried to empathize and understand her emotions. I tried to calm her anger but unfortunately my efforts were in vain. So I continued to pack my things for the upcoming trip and decided to spend the night in the guest room. Realizing how important this wedding was to her, given the countless hardships her friend Carol had endured, I deeply empathized with her. The betrayal of Carol's ex-husband during a life-threatening illness and then his departure due to the inability to observe her gradual demise became the epitome of his cowardice. This heartbreaking ordeal left Carol devastated and exacerbated her already difficult situation. But despite everything, Carol miraculously recovered. Having survived the rejection, Carol decided to take a bold step. She filed for divorce, which provoked a protracted depression that lasted for five long years. Despite the unwavering support of friends and family, their attempts to cheer her up proved futile. But one day, fate intervened, when Carol unexpectedly crossed paths with a charming gentleman in a grocery store. Miraculously, her world was transformed, and she gradually regained her former energetic self. The prayers of her loved ones were finally answered, and the news of Carol's newfound happiness spread like wildfire. A general feeling of joy and relief swept over everyone, and there was an irresistible desire to celebrate this joyful event. It was an extraordinary wedding, filled with love and joy. Sarah, her best friend and bridesmaid, was by her side throughout the event, providing constant support. I understood how important this day was for Sarah, and therefore it was even more difficult for me to refuse to participate in the event. Unfortunately, circumstances left me no other choice. I realized that I had let Sarah down, and I felt a deep sense of remorse realizing that I would have to find a way to make amends and take on the burden of her anger. The next morning, while preparing to leave, I made one last attempt to say goodbye to Sarah with a kiss. But the bedroom door remained closed, and she showed no desire to let me in. I expressed my love to her and promised that I would contact her upon arrival in Germany, but I did not receive a response. With a heavy heart, I reluctantly went to the waiting limousine that took me to the airport. A deep sense of sadness and discontent overwhelmed me, as her actions seemed to lack understanding of my circumstances. After almost two decades of marriage, I was hoping for more understanding and compassion. After trying to contact her one last time before boarding the flight, her mobile phone went unanswered, forwarding me to voicemail. 
After leaving another apologetic message, I longed for reconciliation. I was looking forward to a reply, having already sent a message before departure and another after landing after a 10-hour flight. But so far there is complete silence. No answers, no voice messages, no SMS. Obviously, she is very upset, and I know that I will have to apologize a lot to regain her trust. Having no other choice, I contacted our twin daughters who are in college and told them about the details of my trip, as well as about unexpected changes in my work plans. I informed them that their mother was angry with me and asked them to keep it a secret. I wanted to contact her and check on how she was feeling, expressing my concern and need for confidence in her safety. In response, they treated me with understanding and words of love. These girls have always held a special place in my heart, because I am their devoted father. Upon arriving at the hotel in Germany, I immediately contacted my CEO to find out the latest news, but was horrified to learn that the scheduled meeting had been cancelled. The reason for this unfavorable turn of events was that the CEO of another company suffered a tragic loss in his family, and therefore the meeting had to be postponed. Without hesitation, I dialed the airline's number and secured a non-stop flight to Chicago O'Hare, just a 30-minute drive from the expected reception. Having calculated that I would be able to arrive by 9 p.m., just in time to become a caring husband, I was sure that this would bring joy to her heart. As soon as I rented a car, the GPS skillfully directed me to the check-in hall. When the clock struck nine, I stepped into a bright celebration engulfed by a lively atmosphere. Loud music was playing in the atmosphere, people swayed and stamped to the beat. Drinks were plentiful and spirits were generously poured. The scene was enlivened by intoxicated revelers who were indulging in festivities. Undoubtedly, it was a joyful event, and I felt like a happy person attending it and looking forward to the company of my wife. There were over 200 guests at the reception, and my eyes darted around the room in search of Sarah. Walking up to the welcoming bar, I asked for a double shot of bourbon, and then positioned myself to watch the crowd, hoping to catch a glimpse of my beloved wife. While I was thinking about how we got to this point, memories of the past were swarming in my head. Sarah, who was five years older than me, had recently gone through a painful divorce when our paths came together. Her ex-husband, Dr. Clayton Adams, was a medical resident at Mercy Hospital during their marriage. But his true face came out when it turned out that he was having an affair with a nurse from the hospital. The revelation shocked Sarah, and she cut him out of her life, crushed by a sense of betrayal. All she ever wanted was a blissful existence filled with children and happiness. But this despicable man ruthlessly destroyed her dreams. After their divorce, she found herself in a state of depression and financial struggle, as the limited incomes of local residents and the division of their property left her penniless. Trying to make ends meet, she resorted to working as a waitress, barely covering her expenses. This difficult chapter in her life gave her a deep understanding of the emotions Carol must have been experiencing. When I met Sarah, it was an instant connection. I was completely fascinated by her. Despite her broken and desperate state, I realized that she was a hidden gem waiting to be discovered. As soon as I saw her, it was impossible not to notice her amazing beauty. But it was her heart and compassionate nature that captivated me and eventually led me to fall deeply in love. In troubled times, I became a beacon of hope for her, guided her on a bright path, and changed her life for the better. Our journey together lasted an incredible 19 years and was imbued with the immense love of our precious twin daughters. Sarah valued my unwavering approach to relationships and appreciated my directness. Our conversations revolved around core values such as loyalty and unwavering devotion, creating a sense of security and stability in her. I made it clear that loyalty is a non-negotiable aspect of our partnership, assuring her of my unwavering dedication and refusal to tolerate any form of betrayal. I praised her for her courageous decision to leave an unfaithful spouse, despite the enormous difficulties she may have faced. 
I expressed my understanding that many people can go to such circumstances to save their marriage or maintain financial stability, so I was especially proud of her strength with which she went forward. Trust, loyalty, and devotion were the pillars on which our relationship was built, and it was thanks to them that my life was incredibly pleasant and filled with love. Sarah at 44 looked amazing, and I, being five years younger than her, was in great physical shape. At the age of 39, I found myself at the peak of my existence. Thanks to constant gym sessions and regular 5km runs, I was at the peak of my physical fitness. Not only did I have an impressive physique, but our intimate encounters were incredibly satisfying. Surprisingly, the age difference between us has never created problems and we rarely touched on this topic throughout all the years of our life together. Our journey as parents was very eventful. We raised two wonderful twin daughters named Masha and Carrie, who have now gone to college, living four hours away from home. Watching their joy and accepting the college experience was a great joy for us. As I prepared for the upcoming events, I reflected on our promising future. Our family was strong and our marriage seemed stable. But those thoughts were shattered when I saw my wife sitting alone with Clayton, her ex-husband. Although I knew that Clayton was acquainted with Carol's fiancé, I did not expect him to be at the wedding, especially without his wife. Feeling tired from the journey and consumed with curiosity, I paused, watching them from afar. Their amazing friendliness given their tumultuous history completely amazed me. Intrigued, I decided to observe their actions for a short time, trying to understand their intentions. Alas, my world began to crumble rapidly. Just as I was preparing to step in and put an end to their affectionate communication, I was overwhelmed by a surge of emotion. She rose gracefully from her seat, gently squeezed his hand and led him towards the dance floor. Dressed in an exquisite tight-fitting ivory dress, she radiated undeniable charm, and my heart couldn't help but ache for her. I fervently hoped that it was just an innocent dance. I was shocked by her sheer audacity as they swayed to the rhythm of several slow songs. I sipped my drink imperceptibly, anticipating what would happen next. It was obvious that Sarah had taken alcohol, as evidenced by her flirtatious behavior. A common occurrence after several drinks. It was normal that she started being nice to me and playing with me. But I was caught off guard by the fact that she was openly kissing another man in front of her friends, ignoring the fact that everyone knew she was married to me. This made me even more angry. When I saw my wife showering caresses on another person, I was overwhelmed by a mixture of insult and anger. I remained motionless, unable to comprehend the shocking scene unfolding before my eyes. My emotions intensified when he shamelessly groped her from behind and entered into passionate kisses, to which she responded without hesitation. Spurred on by my mounting anger, I thought about intervening and putting an end to this spectacle, but before I could take a step, he led her back to the table and sat her down in the corner. They began to kiss passionately, reminding the newlyweds. When I noticed her hand hidden under the table, I was overwhelmed by a wave of awareness. It became undeniably clear that my marriage had come to a bitter end. My father's wise words rang in my head, reminding me that decent men do not tolerate disrespect. With this newfound understanding, I decided to act, albeit without cruelty. Thinking about making a scene, interrupting a flawless wedding ceremony and stopping their union in the bud, I wondered about the purpose. Why should I interfere if she wants him? I'll give it to him because it doesn't belong to me anymore. With eerie calm, I took out my phone, zoomed in, took some detailed pictures and a short video, and then sent her a text message. In the message, I conveyed the good news. My dear, the scheduled meeting was postponed, so I came back. Although it looks like you're in good hands this evening, I'm going home, and I suppose you're going to spend the night with Dr. Clayton. Now I understand the reason for your unresponsiveness to my calls and the lack of responses to my text messages. I hope you will find joy when our marriage is over. By the time you get back tomorrow, I'll be gone. After clicking the send button, I calmly watched her, 
waiting for her reply to the message. Holding my breath, I saw her phone light up, indicating an incoming message. She noticed the glow on the table and reached for the phone, quickly fingering the buttons in search of a message. Sarah's face quickly changed and assumed a serious expression, indicating sudden sobriety. As soon as her reaction became obvious, I quickly left the hall and headed for my car. Sarah's panic was obvious when she noticed me making my way to the exit, but I managed to slip out before she could catch up with me. As I unlocked the car door, her desperate voice pierced the air, begging me to wait. I gave her a stern look and shook my head dismissively, got into the car and quickly drove out of the parking lot, leaving her behind. As soon as I got into the driver's seat, my phone started ringing incessantly, but I was unable to answer or engage in conversation with her. If she really wanted to be with her ex, then our relationship was definitely over. After witnessing what I had just done, it became an undeniable truth. We have come to the end of the road. Having divorced this unfaithful fool 22 years ago, she willingly returns to his arms at the first opportunity. But she will have to be responsible for explaining this situation to our family and children. My phone was flooded with countless desperate texts and messages. Tony, please come back. Let me explain everything. I still love you. Please come back. Disappointment gripped me when I heard her pleading, insisting that everything was not as it seems. She claims to love me. After two days of grueling 10-hour flights in a row, and the disappointment that I had received neither a response nor a confession from her, I could not bring myself to accept her apology. The resentment inside me grew exponentially as I watched her interact with Clayton, and I absolutely did not want to communicate with her anymore or tolerate her deception. Despite her persistent attempts, accompanied by numerous phone calls and text messages, in the end I had to stop and park the car, overcoming disappointment. It was at this point that I decided to reply to her with one message that briefly conveyed my emotions. Go to hell. Fortunately, in the midst of all this chaos, my work continued to flourish. When my children had already enrolled in college and their education was fully funded, I found myself unencumbered and free. Still in the prime of my life, I saw an opportunity to start from scratch. Heading back to Nashville, I couldn't resist the urge to stop at a diner after a four-hour drive. In search of food and a short rest, I parked the car and got comfortable. While I was devouring a plate of scrambled eggs and bacon, I had a thought. Why not express my emotions to the whole world? And at that moment, Facebook, the reigning champion among social media platforms, seemed to me the perfect platform for expressing my feelings. Everyone gathered and shared their life stories. While I was enjoying my meal, I impulsively changed my relationship status on Facebook from happily married to single and ready for a relationship. In addition, I uploaded a couple of pictures showing Sarah and Clayton sharing a passionate kiss during the wedding. In one of the pictures, Clayton's hand rested unmistakably on her chest. Along with the photo, I explained that Sarah had decided to reunite with her ex-husband, implying that she was being updated while I was free again. Of course, my actions might seem stupid, but at that moment, I couldn't deny the truth. I was moving forward in life without her. What puzzled me was how she could have chosen Clayton, her ex, who was almost 50 years old, bald, overweight, and, not to be arrogant, in no way improved. I couldn't help but wonder why she would abandon our relationship for a man who had already betrayed her. Maybe she wanted to be with a doctor, not an accountant. To be honest, it hurt me. In fact, it was very painful. At that moment, I was overwhelmed by a wave of pain that surpassed all previous memories. Emotions of sadness and anger coexisted, but against the background of the absurdity of the situation I was forced to laugh. It struck me that she gave up her 19-year marriage for an older man who once betrayed her more than two decades ago. Both of them, no matter how unworthy, could have each other. I refused to tolerate such blatant disrespect. It was contrary to the principles I cherished. Although some might consider it a simple kiss and minor physical contact, I was not one to tolerate such behavior. 
From my point of view, I think there is no excuse to leave her. I'm sorry, but according to my personal beliefs, my partner should either be completely devoted to me or have the freedom to seek other relationships. We are all responsible for the consequences of our choices. After a late breakfast and two hours of sleep in the car, I continued my journey and arrived home at 7 in the morning, where I was greeted by a stream of notifications on my phone. The incessant calls seemed endless and overwhelmed me with their volume. A few minutes after turning on the phone I was overwhelmed by a staggering stream of messages, the total number of which exceeded a hundred. Among them were messages from Sarah, her parents, her sister, and several close friends. When the silence was broken by the incessant ringing, I noticed that it was Sarah on the line. I wondered if she'd gotten enough sleep the night before, or if she'd spent the night with Clayton, and I quickly dismissed the thought. Now that it was all over, I focused on getting my stuff out of the house and moving on. Despite this, I have always maintained good relations with her family, so when they called me that morning, I answered by explaining the situation to her father. I completely ignored her unhappiness in our marriage, but her infidelity eventually ruined our once happy life together. The blatant disrespect she showed in front of our acquaintances is something I can't stand anymore. Obviously, she still harbors feelings for this despicable man, and now she can be with him. I am determined to find a woman who will truly appreciate what I bring and be faithful to me. James, I have no other choice. I'm leaving today. I decided to put the house up for sale right away. I'm going to see a lawyer tomorrow morning to start the divorce proceedings. Until the house is sold, she can continue to live here, and rest assured I will ensure justice throughout the divorce process. I may be a bit traditional, but I just can't coexist with a woman who wants someone else's company. Although she has already made her decision, I have serious doubts about the wisdom of her choice this time. James arrived an hour later and begged me to hold off and talk to her before taking drastic measures. He urged me to give her an opportunity to explain herself. I asked him to take another look at this photo, urging him to pay attention to how shamelessly they engaged in public displays of love during the wedding. I couldn't put up with such behavior, especially since it was with her ex-partner, which looked like a direct insult to me. Even her father expressed disappointment with her action, and my quick and decisive reaction. When I crossed the threshold of our house, I was overwhelmed by a wave of sadness from the realization that what had once been our joyful abode had turned into a simple facade of our crumbling marriage. For the past five years, we have dedicated ourselves to turning our home into the perfect haven. During this period, mortgage rates remained below an impressive 3%, and the value of our house doubled. As the account holder, I decided to refinance the property at full value, which allowed me to extract almost $500,000 from our beloved abode. Without delay, I have allocated a significant amount of $200,000 in trust funds for each of our daughter's college education, and also set aside an additional amount to provide them with a favorable start in life. We used the remaining $100,000 to beautify our house, turning it into an impressive exhibit that brought us great satisfaction and pride. Although the lower interest rate resulted in an increase in the monthly payment of $1,700, which exceeded our previous payment after using our own capital, this was an obvious solution. To cover the additional monthly expenses, Sarah decided to return to work as a secretary. At the same time, my salary was quite decent, nothing extravagant. But having recently been promoted to the position of CFO, I expected that next year I would receive stock options that would serve as our pension fund. Sarah showed no interest or involvement in our finances as long as her needs were met, relying on my financial knowledge to maintain a comfortable lifestyle. Despite my repeated attempts to explain what stock options are, she just turned off and did not understand what was going on. Since this lack of interest didn't really matter, I brushed it off and consoled myself with the prospects of our future. But it was during this merger that my marriage seemed to collapse. I had the opportunity to receive a substantial bonus in the form of 40,000 stock options, 
provided that I succeed. But in order to use these options, you had to wait a few years. Despite this, the prospect of the stock reaching the level of $100 a piece gave me a sense of confidence in the future. Since the merger was currently on hold, stock options were not subject to settlement in the divorce. Consequently, my plan was to file for irreconcilable differences and divide our assets accordingly. The amount in our savings account was about $50,000. Despite the fact that we planned to split the proceeds from the sale of the house, we realized that there would be nothing to share because of the large debts. At 44, Sarah would have been left with only a car and a sum of $25,000. If she had stayed true to herself, she would have had a loving life and a stable future, but her world was about to turn completely upside down. My anger and insult overcame all the remaining love and pleasant memories hidden inside me. Right now, my only desire is to take revenge and make her realize that she has rejected her happiness. When I looked at Clayton two long decades later, I was overwhelmed by a wave of memories, both pleasant and painful. He was once a devoted husband until his infidelity ruined our marriage. Our bond has always sparkled with chemistry and passion, but he's a dime compared to Tony. My husband was undoubtedly a more attractive, exceptional lover, and the love I have for him is immeasurable. So why did I end up in this perplexing situation, allowing Clayton to encroach on my personal boundaries by touching and kissing me? Although I knew it was inappropriate, I couldn't resist the temptation to flirt. Of course, I drank an excessive amount of alcohol, but I couldn't bear to have Tony by my side. Deep down, I know perfectly well that I should have known better and put an end to this behavior, but this is undoubtedly encouraging. Strangely enough, I still perceive him as a kindred spirit, and harmless flirting seems harmless. After all, Clayton was already divorced, and Tony didn't change his plans to be here with me, where he rightfully belongs. Considering how important this wedding is to me, I think I deserve a little bit of fun. After another kiss, a pleasant warmth enveloped me. Memories of our previous kisses flooded over me, igniting sensual anticipation as he hugged me tightly while we danced. In this secluded place, where everyone was intoxicated, there was an opportunity for playful indulgences. Being sure that our actions would go unnoticed, we considered light affectionate gestures, but nothing more. As soon as Tony gets back, I'll fix this momentary lapse. Suddenly my phone lit up, indicating an incoming text message. Considering that all my friends are here, it could be Tony. Oh my God. Tony confirms his arrival. He caught me kissing Clayton. This is a disaster. Turning to the bewildered Clayton, I apologize that I urgently need to go to the bathroom. I exclaimed hurriedly, running out of the hall. Catching a glimpse of a door closing in the hallway, I raced down the hallway as fast as I could on my stilettos. Oh my God, it's definitely Tony. While we were standing with Clayton, Tony noticed us. In desperation, I called out to him, begging him to wait. But he was silent, quickly getting into the car. Determined, I tried to chase after him, but he sped off, leaving me behind. Now my repeated attempts to contact him through calls and messages remain unanswered. I can't help but wonder how many text messages I sent him, and each one was met with silence. Of course, he's furious and I can't blame him. Despite numerous calls and dozens of messages, my heart broke to pieces when all I got in response was an insulting go to hell. Two of my close friends found me kneeling on the street and their concern was obvious when they asked what was wrong with me. When I told them about the situation, their faces became shocked. They realized the seriousness of my actions and the possible consequences that I could face. They were well aware of Tony's relentless nature and were afraid that we would be in trouble if he stumbled upon our gathering. The clock striking 10 a.m. in our shared residence in Nashville hung over my thoughts. As I was packing my things into the truck, a wave of nostalgia swept over me, forcing me to sit down at the kitchen table and drink the last cup of coffee in the walls that we had built together. When I put the empty cup in the sink, I was overwhelmed by a wave of sadness and anger, Leaving a laconic note on the table, 
I asked her to refrain from contacting me until the divorce papers were prepared. Without signing the note, I deliberately left my wedding ring on the papers. Before I finally left, I turned on my laptop, carefully divided our funds and terminated our shared credit card, paying off the remaining balance. From that day on, she had to answer only for herself. If she decided to oppose the divorce, she would have the burden of paying all expenses. It was impossible to cope with the mortgage and utility bills on their own. The house being desired will be quickly sold at an appropriate price. Otherwise, if she had decided not to contest the divorce, we could have quickly dissolved this sham marriage, allowing her to return to her cherished Clayton. After leaving my once peaceful haven, I went to a misty and unfamiliar realm. Subsequently, I learned from friends who attended the wedding that Sarah was devastated after I left. They were relieved to see that she had stopped crying. But the severity of the events of the previous night still lingered in her eyes. Her friends, overwhelmed with anxiety for Sarah's well-being, left me a lot of voice and text messages urging me to contact her. Fearing that her emotional state might disrupt the joyful atmosphere of the wedding celebration, they took it upon themselves to escort her to a hotel room and put her to bed, diligently checking on her throughout the night. When the first rays of dawn turned the room into a soft glow, Sarah woke up from her slumber, and memories came flooding back to her with the weight of a thousand tears. The worry on the faces of the friends was replaced by instant relief when they noticed the absence of tears. But there was a tacit understanding between them that the wounds inflicted the previous night still needed time to heal. Despite her numerous attempts to contact me, pleas for forgiveness and requests to call her, I chose to completely distance myself from her. After witnessing something that deeply affected me, I made a conscious decision to ignore all her calls and messages. Eventually, Sarah returns home. And on Sunday morning, I wake up feeling the effects of a terrible hangover and dreading the impending divorce. At noon, I board a flight home, and to my surprise, my father picks me up from the airport. Later, I find out that Tony informed his father that he couldn't give me a ride and needed another person. My father's worried expression reflected my own deplorable state. He has always been my rock, so when I saw him, I hurriedly went to him, seeking comfort in his arms. Tears streamed down my face as I clung to his shoulder in awe. Daddy? I've ruined everything. I think Tony dumped me, I managed to say through sobs. His face filled with sadness, and he spoke softly to his suffering daughter. I spoke with him this morning and the situation doesn't look promising. You know, Tony, what could you be thinking? And with Clayton? I can't figure out what came over me. I was intoxicated and full of anger at Tony for not coming to the wedding. I admit my mistakes, but I desperately seek forgiveness from him, Dad. Please understand that I have never had an intimate relationship with him. Honey, judging by the photos I've seen, it might seem that you and he had an intimacy. I'm not sure Tony is the kind of person who forgives easily. You know his character, and the way you were with another man in these photos will be considered a betrayal for him. When she entered the house, she began to pray. Knowing Tony, she expected him to wait, but deep down she knew he would disappear. She spent the rest of the day in tears, desperately trying to contact Tony, hoping for an opportunity to apologize and start a conversation. The irony of the situation struck her. She had cheated on Tony with the same man who had betrayed her years ago. In an instant, her beloved Tony, the man she truly loved and cherished, seemed to have been destroyed beyond recognition. Tony's wedding ring confirmed his absence. It was on the table with a short note. Having decided to continue working, I settled in an empty apartment of the company, intended for visiting clients. Since no one was going to use it, I turned to my loyal friend and CEO Bill to get his consent for temporary residence. He was sympathetic to my situation, as he had experienced something similar in the past. Bill even went further, advising me to postpone the selection of options for this year in order to collect them over time. This suggestion coincided with his own experience. The next day I went to my office located on the 16th floor 
knowing full well that Sarah's presence would be undesirable and forbidden. Before that, I had clearly instructed the security service so that if they tried to see me at the workplace, they would be immediately expelled from the building. Knowing their competence, I believed that they would effectively handle the situation. Unfortunately, Sarah did not meet my expectations on Monday and still showed up. But she quickly realized that any communication between us in the workplace is strictly prohibited. Despite her desperate attempts to communicate with me, I remained firm in my decision to completely distance myself from her. I kept my location a secret from her, leaving her unaware of where I was staying while ignoring her attempts to contact her. As a result, she found herself in a state of complete isolation, consumed by anger at herself, overwhelmed by loneliness and fear of what lies ahead. At this time my girls, deeply worried about their mother, inundated me with frantic phone calls, begging me to talk to her. I tried to explain to them that their mother had made her choice in favor of another man, and this decision contradicted my categorical rejection of infidelity. Even before they had a chance to object, I made it clear that according to my beliefs, her act was treason. My daughters were wise enough not to get into arguments with me and showed respect for my decision. In a calm manner, I tried to explain that their mother preferred another person to me, which led to our impending divorce. Despite this, I assured them that I would always be there for them, and I wanted to keep my presence in their lives. I advised them to remember this experience when they get married and to refrain from disrespecting or betraying their future husbands. It was important for them to understand that most men would not tolerate such disrespect. After my Facebook post, a whole series of funny things happened. Not only did I receive a lot of calls from friends and relatives demanding explanations, but I also became very popular with the ladies. Unexpectedly, I found myself back on the dating scene, chatting with women who were much younger and filled with lively energy and enthusiasm, which I had not experienced for many years. The days when I endured Sarah's constant complaints and negativity were replaced by passionate intimacy and affectionate text messages. I was constantly harassed by a group of lively and energetic girls who were determined to have a good time. But a month later, I met my future wife, Cheryl. Our connection was instant, and over time we grew closer, eventually becoming a couple just a few months after my divorce was finalized. Sarah, my ex-wife, was deeply upset to learn about my new lifestyle. She was mostly angry at herself, but she also harbored feelings of jealousy and resentment at me for not giving our relationship another chance before the divorce. Despite her requests to meet and discuss everything, I chose to reject all her requests and communicated exclusively through our lawyers. In the end, the house was quickly sold and the situation was settled. After deducting the real estate fee and closing costs, the remaining capital amounted to less than a thousand dollars which I specifically ordered to give to Sarah. Although the lawyers stubbornly defended my preferences, the court eventually decided not to allow the seizure of potential future income. Instead, the settlement agreement was based on my average income. Given that Sarah was working, the alimony payment would not have been too burdensome, and after careful consideration, I eventually agreed to support her for two years, at the rate of $2,000 per month. It is important to note that such an agreement does not represent a significant financial benefit for either party. However, the funds I allocated to Sarah were enough to feed herself until she regained stability or found someone else stupid enough to marry her, and I was not going to fulfill this role. Over time, our communication has been reduced to a simple exchange of views through our legal representatives. Eventually, Sarah decided to move to Chicago, where she had a network of friends and a support system. Having no other options, she decided to stay with the elderly Dr. Clayton. Despite this, it was obvious that she would never experience the same level of satisfaction that she once felt in my presence. On reflection, she realized the consequences of her anger and self-centeredness. Although she knew how I would react, she recklessly made a disastrous choice. Despite the fact that she did not have any sexual relations with him that night, 
She deliberately ignored our relationship and behaved as if she was lonely and actively looking for someone new. It wasn't until three years later at our daughter's graduation that our paths crossed again. The sight of my 28-year-old pregnant wife Cheryl and our one-year-old daughter Jolene brought tears to Sarah's eyes. At the age of 47, Sarah's appearance has noticeably suffered from the years she has lived. Dr. Clayton, being astute, kept a respectful distance as he accompanied her. But later, Sarah was able to find a moment to be alone with me. Tony, I haven't had a chance to apologize, she confessed. I should have been wiser. Not a day goes by that I don't think about my stupid decisions that weekend. We had everything and yet I foolishly threw it all away. You were the perfect husband, and I really miss the wonderful life we once shared. Sarah, it's all in the past and I don't hold a grudge against you. Despite the fact that I could not imagine that you would find solace in someone else's arms during my absence, I consider it necessary to express my gratitude to you. You have given me 19 incredible years of life and two wonderful daughters, and I will cherish this love forever. Sarah, the reality is that your betrayal led me to discover Cheryl, and starting a new path with Jolene allowed me to let go of the anger I once held against you. Take care of yourself and prioritize your future. The past is just a distant memory. I wish you good luck and look forward to your presence at the upcoming significant events in the lives of our daughters. At that very moment, Cheryl came up to me, hugging our daughter, and I began to introduce them. The significant age difference was obvious. At 47, Sarah could easily have been mistaken for Cheryl's mother. Once again, Sarah couldn't help but feel remorse for losing the man she loved because of one night spent in anger and self-centeredness. We reunited at the girl's wedding party. Despite her decision never to marry, she was satisfied with life with Clayton, who treated her with kindness. Seeing me surrounded by my new family, with two adorable little girls, she was reminded of what was so precious. Unfortunately, the affectionate existence she once enjoyed has disappeared forever, condemning her to a lonely existence burdened with remorse for lost love and precious moments. As a final act of retribution, we crossed paths again that fateful summer following the exercise of my stock options. After buying my previous house, which was recently put up for sale again, all my family and friends, with the exception of Sarah, felt an overwhelming excitement. Returning to our old home, filled with countless cherished memories, brought joy to everyone, especially my daughters, who gladly recalled their upbringing in our affectionate monastery. It's a pity that Sarah chose a different path, because she would have found great pleasure in being here and living the life that we imagined together. But life is moving forward, and I really enjoy building a new life and creating new memories with my amazing wife and our little girls. After another year, Sarah began to look very bad. Her former beauty was rapidly disappearing. She also gained weight, which spoiled her once beautiful figure. From my daughter's words, I learned that Sarah found Clayton with a young woman who worked with him at the clinic. Sarah was in a desperate state for a long time, she experienced the betrayal of this man again. Sarah had no choice but to ask for shelter from our daughters, and fortunately we raised kind and well-mannered girls who did not refuse shelter to their mother. I think Sarah has learned her lesson for the rest of her life, and she will never forget the stupid thing she did by betraying me. At the usual time, at six in the morning, the alarm clock woke us up and my wife Anita and I reluctantly got up to start our day. With a loud groan, I wearily sat down on the edge of the bed and swung my legs to the floor. What happened? You're like an old man, she joked playfully as she headed to the bathroom. Reflecting on the events of the previous evening, I chuckled when I heard her laughter coming from the bathroom. It seems that her action made me feel like an old man. We engaged in intense lovemaking, but when my partner went on a business trip, I was looking forward to a lonely week at home. The sound of the shower running encouraged me to join her, but I soon realized that I didn't have the strength. 
The previous evening had exhausted me considerably. When she returned to the bedroom later, radiating positivity, I found myself wallowing in self-pity. Come on, dear old man, get up and shine. We need two hardworking people to cover the mortgage on this house. Okay, okay, I'm getting up, I replied, awkwardly making my way to the bathroom to freshen up. After that, we gathered downstairs again for a morning meal before she went to the airport and I went to the office. Anita, being an experienced lawyer, and I both held positions at a respectable manufacturing facility in St. Louis. Anita, a negotiation specialist, often accompanies teams on business trips outside the company. She went on this trip to negotiate a new subcontract with a well-known aerospace company located in Denver. These negotiations were a regular part of her annual routine, and each time she had to leave for at least a week. Now Anita is 35 years old. Twelve years ago, she graduated from the State University with honors. At an impressive height of 5 feet 4 inches, she possessed striking attractiveness. I am deeply in love with a woman who has captivating feminine qualities, weighing 125 pounds. My name is Jack Fillmore. I work as an engineer at the same reputable company where my wife works. At 37 years old, I am 6 feet 1 inch tall and maintain a weight of 165 pounds through regular workouts. Our shared passion for golf has united my wife and me, and we often play foursome with close friends. The amazing path of our love began at a picnic in the company, where I immediately fell head over heels in love with her. She must have had a similar experience, because we got married just six months after a whirlwind courtship. Now, after seven years of marriage, we recently bought the house we've been living in for the last three months. It was here that we dreamed of starting a family, and Anita even stopped taking birth control pills after returning from a trip. The anticipation of us becoming parents overwhelmed us, and Anita planned to be a stay-at-home mom until our children went to school. Our parents live nearby and are looking forward to the arrival of our babies. I helped Anita pack her travel bag in the car after we finished breakfast, and then kissed her fondly goodbye. As she got into the car, tears welled up in her eyes. I can't wait for the day when I don't have to travel anymore, my love. These goodbyes are so difficult, she said, her voice filled with sadness. I nodded in understanding and replied, I despise them as much as you do, dear. But don't worry, you'll be back on Friday night and we can have a quiet lunch together. How do you like it? Anita smiled faintly and replied, it sounds good. Bye. After watching her reverse out of the garage and onto the street, I waved goodbye to her and wearily headed into the house to finish preparing to leave for the office. Upon arriving at work, I went up to the engineering department, where I briefly looked into the break room to have a cup of coffee, and then headed to my desk. As soon as I sat down at the table, the phone suddenly rang, interrupting my brief respite. This is Fillmore speaking, I replied quickly. Jack, could you take a minute and come into my office? Evan's voice came on the line. Of course, Evan, I'll be there soon. Walking up to Evan's office with coffee in hand, I greeted him with a wave of my hand and sat down in an armchair. Jack, I think you'll find this intriguing, he began. Recalling our conversation last Friday about Anita's upcoming travels, he presented me with an opportunity. Anita won't be here this week, and I have a suggestion for you. Gil Hawkins, our maintenance engineer in California, is unwell and cannot solve a customer problem in San Jose related to one of our models. Given your extensive experience with this model, I thought you might be interested. Do you want to go to San Jose to explore it? It's pretty quiet here right now, and you're right, I'm alone right now. When would you like me to go there? Immediately. Let Katie arrange your trip and get tickets, and you contact the client to inform him about your visit and find out about the problem. It's a great plan. I'll start working on it right now. I began to feel the joy of life again. I can fly out of here this afternoon and get to the customer's location by tomorrow morning. To this end, I approached Evan's secretary, Katie, and explained to her my flight and ticket booking requirements. After that, I returned to my desk and contacted the customer to understand the essence of the problem. 
After collecting the information, I went home to pack my things. During the trip I was overcome with a feeling of excitement, as a plan began to form in my head, if I complete my tasks on time. On the way home, I started thinking about the idea of surprising my wife by making a stop in Denver. The thought of spending a few days with her in Denver filled me with more and more excitement. At the airport, while waiting for my flight to depart, I tried to call Anita on her mobile phone. Unfortunately, she didn't answer, so I left a voice message saying that I would stay with my parents for a couple of days and asked her to contact me in the evenings on my mobile. Fortunately, everything went smoothly. On Tuesday morning, I arrived at the customer and successfully made the necessary changes. After examining it and making sure it was working properly, I spent the afternoon putting everything in order. When I was done, I returned to the hotel and immediately called the airline to book a flight that would take me to Denver by 9 o'clock in the evening, mountain time. After leaving the hotel in San Jose, I went to the San Francisco airport. On the way, I decided to have dinner. While I was enjoying my meal, Anita contacted me on her cell phone, and we had a short conversation. She asked how my parents were doing, and I replied that I was at their house. In addition, she informed me that the negotiations are progressing positively. Exhausted, she longed for a quiet evening in her hotel room. After saying goodbye affectionately, we parted, and I went on my flight. Arriving at the hotel where Anita lived, I went to the reception desk at exactly 9.45 a.m. After confirming my identity, I was given a card giving me access to her room. Imperceptibly crossing the threshold of the room, I saw the soft glow of a lamp standing on a computer table, as well as her laptop, which was not working. But Anita was nowhere to be found. I put my suitcase on the floor and looked around the bedroom, but found it empty. The same can be said about the bathroom. Disappointed, I decided that she hadn't returned to her room yet. I was wondering if I should sit and wait or go down to the hall and see if she was there. But my attention was suddenly attracted by the slightly ajar door to the next room. Curious, I cautiously approached it, and it swung open noiselessly on its manicured hinges. Entering the living room of the adjoining room, I looked around, but found no one. Overwhelmed with confusion, I cautiously entered the room and was immediately startled by a soft moan coming from the bedroom. My stomach ached with excitement. I was sweating and tiptoed to the door. As I got closer, my heart started pounding and my breath caught when I saw the scene in the dimly lit room. Anita stood in front of me, completely undressed, in the arms of an unknown man, whose face remained unclear. Although my initial instinct was to rush inside, meet her, and vent my rage on the man, reason prevailed, forcing me to pause and consider my next move. Stepping carefully away from the door, I headed back to her room. Taking out a digital camera from my travel bag, which I had brought with me to take some pictures as a keepsake, I went to the door to the next bedroom. Carefully turning off the flash and adjusting the camera settings to take into account the low light, I stood quietly taking several pictures of the scene unfolding on the bed. None of them seemed to notice my inconspicuous presence, as they were deeply absorbed in their work. They closed their eyes, completely oblivious to the world around them. After making sure they were settled in their room, I examined the open briefcase on the table and found a business card in it. Curious, I read the name on the card. Sam Harris, the company's chief negotiator. I slipped the card into my pocket, returned to the room and took out the interface cable I had brought with me to connect the camera to the computer. With careful precision, I connected the camera to her laptop. Both my laptop and my wife's laptop had the same photo program installed, which allowed me to easily transfer a picture from my camera to her desktop. After completing this task, I carefully put the camera back in my travel bag and quietly left her room. Just before I left, I accidentally heard her experiencing a moment of pleasure. The emotions that overwhelmed me were overwhelming and I almost burst into tears on the spot. But I managed to pull myself together and continued on my way to the elevator. Finally, 
I returned the card to the front desk. After contacting the airline, I asked about the departure time of the next flight heading to St. Louis. Fortunately, I found a flight at 6.30 a.m., which allowed me to get home by 9.30 a.m. I couldn't help but think that by this time Anita would most likely start her negotiations, unaware that she had been discovered, and this revelation would mark the end of our marriage. After this revelation, I returned to the airport and checked into a nearby motel where sleep would not come to me. When I recalled the haunting images from her hotel bedroom, tears streamed down my face, releasing the pain trapped inside me. By the time I left the motel at five in the morning, I had exhausted all my tears, and I had one firm thought left, to end our marriage as soon as possible. When I returned to St. Louis, my cell phone suddenly rang, just as I was about to get into the car. Glancing at the caller ID, I noticed that it was Anita calling. Deciding not to pay attention to it, I turned off the phone and headed home. When I entered the house, I noticed that the phone was still ringing insistently. Curiosity got the better of me, and I checked the caller ID again, but found that it was Anita again. Deciding to transfer the call to the answering machine, I listened to Anita's tearful voice coming from the receiver. Jack, please call me as soon as possible. I have something important to discuss with you, my love. Despite her desperate pleas, I decided to ignore her heartbreaking sobs and went upstairs to change clothes instead. After making the necessary preparations, I rented a u hallet and immediately returned to the house to begin the packing process. According to my calculations, I expected her arrival around 4 o'clock in the afternoon and intended to vacate the premises by that time. Although it took several hours, I successfully moved all my personal belongings to a rented storage room. Before I started packing, I made an appointment with our lawyer for the same day. After unloading my things in the vault, I immediately went to the lawyer's office for our meeting. I asked him to start the divorce process immediately, considering whether to indicate adultery as the reason, but in the end, I settled on incompatibility. That way I can keep the adultery card in case she disputes the divorce. In addition, I asked him to make a new will, appointing my brother as the beneficiary. After checking into the bank, I transferred half of our savings and balances in new accounts exclusively to my name. Then I contacted my investment advisor to perform similar actions with our shared accounts. Overwhelmed with grief, I headed for my parents' house, clutching my suitcase tightly. When I went up the steps and stepped through the half-open door, my mother saw me and exclaimed with a mixture of concern and surprise, Jack, where have you been? Anita has been trying desperately to get in touch with you, calling here many times. Did you tell her that you were seeking refuge here? My father, a pensioner, joined us, and sitting down comfortably, I gathered my strength to tell the bitter truth. Their faces contorted in shock when I told them about Anita's infidelity and the breakdown of our once expensive marriage. I asked if I could stay with them temporarily until I found a furnished apartment. To my surprise, they granted my request. It seems that my calculations turned out to be very accurate, because around six in the evening when we were about to have dinner, the doorbell rang. My father got up to answer, and when he returned, he was accompanied by an agitated Anita. Jack, why aren't you answering my calls? I needed to talk to you. You have completely emptied the house of your belongings. I think the message I left on your desktop would provide the necessary information. Could we find a suitable place to talk, my love? I really ask you to do this. Anita, I have to make it clear that I am no longer your lover, and I don't want to discuss anything with you. I have already started the divorce process, and our legal representatives can handle all the necessary issues. The events I witnessed in Denver have completely destroyed my previous attachment to you, and I urge you to leave so that I can finish my meal. Jack, I beg you, reconsider your actions. It is very important that we talk before moving on. Can you really say something that will justify or atone for your infidelity? The incident I witnessed certainly didn't look like you were being forced to do this, and I have photographic evidence to prove it. 
but I must warn you that I intend to meet your lover Sam tomorrow. Perhaps his wife will offer a different perspective on this situation. Oh my god, can't we discuss this? I'm asking you, Jack. Please, Anita, just go away. I'm starting to feel like my dinner is getting cold. Let me make a suggestion. Would you write me a heartfelt letter explaining how you justify breaking your wedding promises? I believe that a smart lawyer like you can eloquently explain that I was ultimately responsible for everything and that you can still deeply love and appreciate me. Fighting back tears, she looked away for a moment, but couldn't help but turn around before she reached the door. Jack, I'm begging you, let's not end our marriage without talking to you. Goodbye, Anita. While my parents sat stunned, she left, and tears were still streaming down her face. Jack, that was incredibly cruel, Mom said, her voice full of disappointment. Mom, do you want to see the photos where I captured her and her lover? That's what's really cruel. She has absolutely no respect for me, and I cannot continue to live with such betrayal. How can I trust her again? Do you really want me to have children with a woman like her? Finally, my father broke the silence and said, I understand, son. Maybe when the emotions settle down, you'll start looking at things from a different perspective. I knew that you sincerely love Anita, but I personally held a different point of view, Dad. Can we move our conversation to another topic so that I can fully focus on digesting food? Okay, son. Let's talk about this later. When I left the house that Monday morning, I was overcome with a feeling of self-pity for having to leave Jack, and yet, I imagine the joy that awaits me upon my return, when we finally begin our journey towards starting a family. We waited patiently, making sure that our financial and career aspects were well established before taking on parenting duties. At the moment, everything has been practically agreed upon. The trip to Denver was uneventful. Throughout the trip, I sat next to Sam Harris, our esteemed chief negotiator. We briefly discussed the upcoming talks scheduled for the next day and then casually exchanged views on current events in our families. Sam knew about my plans to retire after pregnancy and expressed his opinion that he would miss my presence. Sam, at the age of 48, who'd been married for 20 years and had two school children, had a wealth of experience our partnership as a negotiating duo long preceded my marriage, which created a deep sense of comfort and familiarity between us. The remaining two members of our team were sitting behind us, engrossed in their own discussions. When we got to the hotel in Denver, we checked into our rooms. As usual, Sam and I chose connecting rooms. Initially, this layout was intended to facilitate night meetings to develop a negotiation strategy, but about 10 years ago, it became a catalyst for starting intimate meetings as we convinced ourselves that it was a stress reliever after stressful days of negotiations. We have convinced ourselves that this does not count as cheating on his wife if it benefits our professional life. Sometimes we even joked about it. But over time, when Jack and I got married, I became uncomfortable with our actions, and we decided to end it. But during a particularly difficult negotiation, Sam offered to renew our arrangement to relieve stress and anxiety. Although I hesitated, I finally agreed. And before I knew it, I discovered that I was addicted to repeating our actions. The excitement of committing adultery without being discovered greatly increased my intimate desire when I returned home. Surprisingly, Jack also benefited from this forbidden relationship, which somewhat mitigated my guilt. On the first night of our trip, I refused to meet with Jack because I felt tired after dinner. But after a day filled with negotiations, I still agreed to meet with him the next night. I still don't know exactly at what point and how Jack found out the truth or got an incriminating photo. But the next morning, when I turned on my laptop, I was shocked, completely frozen by what appeared on the screen. Sam, who was next to me, reacted quickly. He slammed the lid shut and politely asked his colleague across the table to take a break for a minute. 
Taking our laptop with us, we hurriedly retreated into the hallway. Sam's anger was palpable. He questioned me about the explicit content displayed on my desktop. Confused and shocked, I replied, Honestly, I have no idea, Sam. The last time I used the computer, it wasn't there. I'm still at a loss. Let me take another look. I opened it again, and we both noticed the photo. Oh shit, it's really you, he exclaimed. I am. How is this even possible? I asked, perplexed. I'm not entirely sure, but it certainly looks like you, and there's a chance that the person underneath you is me, although my face is indistinguishable. Did you leave your laptop unattended yesterday? He asked. My response was immediate. No, he was with me throughout the trip, and even when I stayed in your room. I thought for a moment before asking, could someone have entered your room and taken this photo? He thought about it and replied, I doubt it very much. The door was closed and apparently locked. You should go back to the hotel and find out if anyone received your room key card last night. I'll take care of it here. Try to contact Jack and find out where he was the night before. It is unlikely that he was involved in this case. I talked to him at his parents' house last night. Did you try to reach him on his parents' landline? No, he asked me to contact him on his cell phone. Oh my God, that doesn't sound very good. I was filled with anxiety when I thought about Jack's whereabouts during our conversation. If you become aware of any information, please contact me on your mobile, he urged. It was extremely important to save the situation, so I begged, please do your best to minimize the damage. Saying goodbye, I felt a wave of anxiety wash over me. The possibility that Jax had taken a photo and inserted it into my laptop seemed like blatant evidence that our marriage was coming to an end. Determined to find out the truth, I hurried back to the hotel. Grateful to the helpful receptionist, I quickly caught a taxi and arrived at my destination 15 minutes later. When I returned to the hotel, the first thing I did at the reception was to ask if someone had received a card for my room. After the employee turned to the computer, I was informed that a certain Mr. Jack Fillmore had indeed received a postcard the night before at 9.45 a.m., but it was returned just half an hour later. At that moment, I was struck by the realization that my marriage was most likely on the verge of collapse. The man who owned my heart disappeared, leaving behind a huge void. Despite the heartache, I decided to fight for him, clinging to a glimmer of hope. When I went up to my room, I felt a surge of determination in my veins. I wasted no time trying to contact him on my cell phone and at my workplace. Unfortunately, his mobile phone went unanswered, indicating that it was turned off. Despite this, I left an important voice message asking you to call me urgently. After contacting his secretary at work, I found out that he is currently in California on official business and should return tomorrow. In light of this information, it seemed logical that he went to California and decided to pay an unexpected visit on the way back. I had no idea that a surprise awaited us both. To get more information, I contacted his parents, who informed me that they had not seen him for several days. I asked him to contact him urgently and tell him to call me. I tried to call him at home, but I didn't get a response, although I left a message. Overwhelmed with emotions, I found myself in the room and burst into tears. I realized that the only way to talk to him was to go home, so I quickly booked tickets for the next flight to St. Louis. While packing, I dialed Sam's number on my mobile phone and shared the sad news with him. There was a short silence before he finally spoke. Anita. It seems to me that we are both facing the possibility of divorce or even something worse. Is there anything more terrible than divorce? The company we work for strictly prohibits any romantic relationship between employees in senior positions. If anyone finds out about our relationship, we both face dismissal, which will undoubtedly tarnish our professional reputation. 
It's unbelievable that I didn't think about it in advance, but the thought of losing Jack is much more devastating to me. It would be unpleasant to lose your family too, but it is very important that you return to St. Louis and find Jack. Please try to reason with him. I have already booked a flight scheduled for noon and expect to return at half past five. It is extremely important for me to find him and talk to him. I'll keep you posted on the results. I will stay here until the negotiations are completed. I'm looking forward to your reply. After saying goodbye, we ended the conversation. Hastily gathering my things, including my bag and laptop, I rushed into the lobby. After completing the checkout procedure, I used the hotel's limousine service to get to the airport. All the way back to St. Louis, I prayed fervently that I would be able to talk to Jack. I found myself in a position where I had to explain that our meeting was purely physical and had no emotional significance for him. I risked coming clean, hoping that he would be able to distance himself from my act of infidelity and perceive it as nothing more than a meaningless sexual act. Upon returning home, everything seemed normal until I walked into our bedroom and discovered that all his things were missing. Then it dawned on me. He undoubtedly knew about my offense and decided to leave. I felt an urgent need to find him. After numerous unsuccessful phone conversations, I decided to visit his parents' house in the hope of finding him or getting at least some information about his whereabouts. To my horror, he did visit his parents, but the way he received me was so heartless and ruthless that I felt physically ill. He coldly informed me that he was in the process of divorce proceedings and was not at all interested in talking to me. He made it clear that I couldn't say anything that could change his mind. Mockingly offering to write him a long letter explaining my version, I left his presence feeling emotionally drained and depressed. Tears were streaming down my face as I sat alone in my car. The dreams of a wonderful family that we imagined have been shattered. They will never come true. Thoughts of growing old together, of grandchildren, all this disappeared in an instant. The selfish realization that by the time I found a new partner, I might already be too old to have children caused me even more pain. With a heavy heart, I gathered my strength to start the car and drive back to our deserted house, while my thoughts were absorbed by Jack. Waking up from a restless sleep filled with haunting images of Anita and Sam entwined in bed, I got up early and went downstairs to my parents' house to make fresh coffee. Deciding to find at least some traces of Sam in the captured moments, I took out my laptop and camera and began the process of transferring photos to my computer. My mind was fixated on the idea of identifying Sam among these images. While I was looking through the pictures, Sam's face remained elusive, shrouded in a vague haze, but soon my attention was attracted by an unusual detail adorning his right hand. Upon closer inspection, I found a tattoo that caught my attention. A heart with the name Marie. Marie was Sam's wife, and this discovery gave me the most important information I was looking for. Satisfied with what I found, I went back upstairs to freshen up and get ready for the day. When I came back down, I found that my mother had already woken up and was busy in the kitchen preparing breakfast. Later, during business hours, I took the opportunity to burn several CDs with the photos I received. I made copies of Sam's tattoo and enlarged them. In addition, I printed out several sets and put them in a folder. Then I went to our HR department to meet with manager Phil. Phil and I knew each other because it wasn't a very big company and we played golf together. I put a set of photos from my folder on his desk and presented them to him. Phil, do you know what this is? An intimate photo? He asked, grinning. Although the photos may seem candid, they do show my wife and Sam Harris. The date and time clearly indicate that these photos were taken on Tuesday evening during their stay in Sam's hotel room in Denver. They were on a business trip, participating in negotiations on behalf of the company. I apologize Jack, this situation is regrettable. What steps can I take to fix it? 
One possible course of action is to fire them based on the anti-fraternity clause set out in their contracts with the company. It is worth noting that this point has never been fulfilled in the past. However, if you are confident in the correctness of such a decision, I will act accordingly. I will bring this case to light, which implies that you are considering divorcing Anita because of this. I have already instructed my lawyer to start preparing the necessary documents, but if you don't take any action, I will sue the company. Okay, Jack, I'll discuss this with our legal department and start the process. After that, I approached my boss, Evan, to inform him about the current situation in my personal life. I told shocking details about my wife and Sam Harris, and his reaction was quite adequate, filled with horror. When I asked for a week off from work, he didn't hesitate to give me a vacation. Before saying goodbye, he praised me for successfully resolving an urgent issue during my recent trip to California. The client expressed his admiration for my problem-solving skills, which made it possible to effectively restore the production line. In addition, my boss asked if I would like to take responsibility for the territory of California in connection with the upcoming retirement of an active engineer, who unfortunately had health problems. After telling him that I would think about it and give him an answer when I returned to work next week, I left Evan's office. But before I could leave, Evan's secretary, Katie, intercepted me with the news. Jack, your wife came earlier and was looking for you. She said she would come back later, she informed me. Feeling emotional turmoil, I quickly replied, Katie, I want to make it clear that under no circumstances do I want to see my wife. Please give her this message when she gets back. Overwhelmed with regret, Katie apologized, admitting her ignorance of the situation. I'm deeply sorry, Jack. I wasn't aware of any problems between you two. Disappointed, I replied. There really is a serious problem, Katie. I need to discuss something important with you. I regret to inform you that my marriage is coming to an end. I have learned that my wife and Sam Harris are having an extramarital affair. Knowing Katie's penchant for spreading gossip, I assumed this news would spread quickly. Concerned about how this revelation might affect his wife, I immediately contacted Marie, as I know her from our past meetings at picnics in the company. Hello Marie, I hope you are doing well. This may come as a shock, but I felt it necessary to inform you that I had a conversation with Sam last night. He asked if I had received any messages from you, but refused to reveal the purpose of your potential contact. Marie, we need to talk at the first opportunity. All right, Jack. Could you come now? I have an appointment with the hairdresser at one o'clock in the afternoon, but I'm free now. Is your address still on Fremont Saint? Yes, it is. Okay. I know about your location. I'll be there in 15 minutes. As I approached the Harris house, I was overcome with a sense of anxiety about the actions I was going to take against this woman and her family. But I couldn't ignore the fact that Sam deserved to face the consequences, rather than let Anita bear all the hardships. Hi Jack, come in please, Marie greeted me, gesturing me into the living room. Would you like some coffee? I just made a fresh one, she offered. That would be great Marie. Only black please, I replied. A few moments later she returned with the coffee and settled into the chair opposite me. While thinking about how to break the news, I thought about how important it is to be tactful. After much thought I decided to look into the situation immediately. Marie, I regret to inform you that while in Denver, I discovered that your husband and my wife had an intimate relationship. In this regard I decided to start divorce proceedings with Anita and get them both fired from their jobs. I understand that this news may soon become public, and I would like to inform you about it in advance. If you want, I have photographic evidence to back up my claims which I can provide if you wish. Watching Marie's expression, I was struck by her seemingly indifferent reaction. I have suspected Sam of infidelity during his business trips for many years, but I desperately hoped that this was just a delusion. Despite these doubts, Sam has always been a devoted husband and father, and I didn't want to disrupt the dynamics of our family. But deep down, 
I knew that sooner or later something would happen that would reveal their affair to the whole world. Unfortunately, it seems that this moment has come. I sincerely apologize for the fact that this situation has caused you and your marriage so much suffering. Moreover, given my own point of view, I am concerned about the possible consequences that Sam may face, such as losing his job. Given his advanced age, it may be difficult for him to find another position with a comparable salary. Now I have a difficult task in front of me, to determine the best course of action for myself. May I offer you a collection of photographs that I own? Of course, I'll leave them for you to review when you're ready. I offer my deepest apologies, Marie, but I couldn't ignore it anymore. Anita and I were on the verge of starting our own family, but I can't be with someone I don't trust and appreciate. The mother of our future children must have both of these qualities. I understand everything, Jack. I am grateful that you informed me about this directly and did not hear it from others first. I want to once again offer my sincere apologies for what happened between you and Anita. I can only imagine how devastated and sorry she is, just like Sam is when he finds out that I'm aware of his affair. I would like this to be a one-time occurrence. Then it would be easier to forgive. But I think it's been going on for years, and now that everything is open it's hard to come to terms with it. I value my self-respect and should be able to hold my head high. If I can support you in any way, please feel free to let me know. Saying goodbye to her and returning to my parents, I told her my words. Time passed, and it's been six months since I started the divorce process with Anita. This morning, I finally received a signed agreement officially ending our marriage. After that, I did not communicate or meet with her anymore after the day she arrived at my parents' house. All issues were handled exclusively by my lawyer, leaving no room for personal communication. To settle things, I decided to give up our heavily mortgaged house, along with furniture and decorations, for which huge funds were allocated, in order to sever all ties and claims that she might have to me. In addition, I excluded my name from the mortgage loan, leaving her solely responsible for the payments. Unfortunately, due to unemployment, she had to sell the property in a hurry, and she suffered significant financial losses. She tried to challenge the divorce, but I issued a threatening ultimatum, threatening to change the grounds for divorce to adultery and post intimate photos of her and Sam on the internet if she did not sign the necessary documents within 48 hours. Succumbing to pressure, she met the deadline, eventually giving me the freedom I enjoy today. It seems that she made a choice in favor of her own desires, rather than our relationship. Anyway, she was fired from her previous job, but being an experienced lawyer and negotiator, she managed to find another position within a month. Although the new job may not offer the same salary or benefits as the previous one, I have heard that she is coping and has started dating again. Whoever becomes her boyfriend will undoubtedly need a lot of luck. I can't help but wonder if she revealed to him the details of our divorce and its reasons. Maybe I should think about telling him about it. Marie and Sam went through a divorce, and Marie managed to achieve a significant financial advantage. After he was fired, Sam found a new job, but due to a decrease in salary, it is difficult for him to pay alimony and child support. I currently reside in Santa Maria, California, a serene coastal town conveniently located between the Bay Area and Los Angeles. This location allows me to effectively serve both the southern and northern regions of the state. I moved to this area about four months ago and now live in an apartment complex populated by other unmarried people and young couples. Many of us are trying to save money for a down payment on a house due to the prohibitively high housing costs in this region. Interestingly, my friend also lives in the same complex. We have both gone through a divorce in the past, but we have found solace in each other's company and are optimistic about our future together. I moved to this area about four months ago and now live in an apartment complex populated by other unmarried people and young couples. Many of us are trying to save money for a down payment on a house due to the prohibitively high housing costs in this region. Interestingly, my friend also lives in the same complex. We have both gone through a divorce in the past, 
But we have found solace in each other's company and are optimistic about our future together. Given that I travel often, establishing a trusting relationship with my future spouse is of paramount importance to me because, given the ticking of our biological clock, we need to act soon if we want to start a family.